Hey programmers, welcome back. Now that we had a little lecture on for loops, we'll definitely want to practice them a ton. And so if you haven't already, I want you to pause this walkthrough and actually give this exercise a shot. Strive to be a self-sufficient programmer. And if you get stuck or just wanna go over the solutions, then come back to this video. But for now, let's step through these together. So it looks like in section zero of this little exercise set, we just want to interpret some code snippets and kind of predict uh, how they behave. And so important thing, uh, as we learn how to program is, you know, being able to write code is really contingent on being able to read it in the first place. So let's step through these. And to start, it looks like I need to create a new folder and also a file within. So let me just go ahead and do that. So I'll go ahead and copy the first snippet in. And for these, like we usually do, I want to predict what will print out and then run the code to verify my guess. So let's take a look at this one. So it looks like we have some initial code. We have a console.log hello. So I know that that's gonna print first, right? Because in general, uh, code flows top down. And then from there, we hit our for loop. So if I take a look at this for loop, I can see that it iterates a total of five times, right? I know the variable i is gonna go from zero all the way up to n including four, and that would be five iterations overall. And on every iteration, it's just gonna print out code, right? So I should see hello, then code five times. And after that for loop is done, then it would just go to goodbye. So let's go ahead and run that. So right now, my particular setup, uh, I have my terminal inside of the lecturing folder, but I wanna bring it inside of a loops exercise so it can see where I am, ls, and I want to just cd into that folder. So I'll do cd a loops exercise. Cool. And you'll want to cd in a similar way, depending on where you created your working folder. And now at this point, I can run this file. Cool, and there I have it. And I have exactly five codes printed out, nice. So nice little warm up there. Let's go on to snippet two and I'll create a separate file for that one. So snippet two is a similar flow. Looks like I'm gonna start by just printing out hi, all right, that's nothing fancy. Then I have a for loop to interpret. So if I look at how this for loops variable uh, changes over time, it goes from three all the way up to and including seven. So that gives me about four uh, iterations. And so I expect the code within the for loop to happen four times overall. But looks like on a single iteration, I do two things, right? I print out the literal string program and then the current value of i, right? So I'm gonna see program printed like four times and after every time I print out program, I'm gonna see my current value for i. And so it would just be three, four, five, seven. Then after that for loop is done, I'll print out by. So let's give that a shot, make sure we're correct. I'll make this a little bit bigger Yep, and I see my numbers range from three to seven, which makes total sense. That's like literally uh, what the i variable says. And then I print out program every time before I print out the number. So over here, what I want you to take away is all of the code within the body of the for loop. So when I say body of the for loop, I mean the code within of the curly braces. That entire chunk of code will repeat for every single iteration of this for loop. So moving on to snippet three, it looks like we have a nice function in the mix. Let's step through this one. So it looks like foo is a function and within we have a for loop. So I'll take a close look at how the for loop itself iterates. So it starts at uh, num equals 10 and goes down two, but not including zero and actually subtracts two every iteration. And so if I anticipate how this for loop is gonna flow, it's gonna start at 10 and decrease by two every time, right? So something like 10, eight, six, four, two, and then not exactly zero, right? Cause this num should be strictly greater than zero. Right, so it looks like my very last iteration, I expect it to be two, right? Because if I did minus equals two again, that would bring me zero, which is not greater than zero. So I expect my num to range from 10 down to two. And then I have to interpret these console logs over here, right? So if I kind of jump to the beginning, really the first console log that's going to occur is really line eight, right? Although my code is evaluated top down, when JavaScript looks at this function definition, it's not gonna execute the code inside. So it should print out begin first, then it's gonna call foo. And I already understand foo in isolation. I know a single call to foo is gonna print numbers from 10 down to two, counting by twos, right? Decreasing by two. And then I'm gonna print out end, and I'm gonna print out those numbers 10 down to two once again. So let's run this code, and I should be able to see that pattern. Now it looks like begin happens at the very top, and then again, like we said, foo goes from 10 down to two, decreasing by two every time, then I print out end, and I run the foo function again, so I just have that same range of numbers. So key thing to take away from this snippet is we can totally use uh, for loops in the flow of our existing functions, right? So we're not really breaking our understanding of what we previously learned about functions, we just have to you know, combine both uh, to our understanding. So now let's step through snippet four. 
it looks like in the snippet for example, we actually utilize a nice string iteration pattern, right? So it looks like I have a word variable at the tippy top, just contains the string street. Then our for loop iterates from zero up to, but not including the length of that word. And we hit every I along the way, right? So the way I is going to flow is zero, one, two, and so on, all the way up to, but not including the length of the word. And that's actually very convenient because I know that the first index of the string, that is the index of the S, is exactly zero. And if I think about the length of the string street, it's going to have a length of six, right? Because there are six characters. And if I think about what the last value for I is going to be, it's going to be phi, right? Because I must be strictly less than word.length, so I must be strictly less than six. And the last value that would be is five. So this should just print out I might index as I go, so zero up to and including five, and then right after that, it's gonna print out the character at that index. So I'll run this code and it just iterates through the characters of street, also printing out the index where that character is found beforehand, right? So let's give this a go. If I look at this, it's saying that S is at index zero, T is at index one, R is at index two, and so on. And this is gonna be a very common pattern that we utilize. An important detail here, and you're definitely gonna mess it up sometimes, but it's good that we capture it now, is when you iterate through a string, right? bear in mind that the last index is always one less than the length of that string. So a common mistake is doing something like i less than or equal to word.length, and that would give you one extra iteration. And if I did this, that would mean I'm stepping outside uh, of the string. So on the last iteration of this kind of broken for loop now, i is going to be the index six, but if I use six to index the string, I'm not gonna get a valid character, right? I go zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six is outside of the range of the string. So I get back undefined. So watch out for that little detail in your code. So now finally, let's step through this last snippet that we need to interpret. So here I have snippet five uh, saved to its own file, and this one's gonna be a little more involved, right? I actually have some practical code uh, written over here. So we'll interpret it step by step. It looks like at the very top, we have a total variable. It's gonna be initialized as zero, so nothing too fancy there. Then I have a nice for loop. And if I look at just like the iterations of this for loop, it looks like it ranges from i equals one all the way up to, but not including i equals five, right? So it's gonna go like one, two, three, four, and that's it. And if I look at what a single iteration of this for loop does is, it takes the current value for i and adds it into the total. And the important detail here is it does plus equals, so I know that this is actually going to update the total, kind of accumulating a sum. And after it makes that uh, addition on that same iteration, it's gonna print out the current total. It's gonna repeat that process uh, four times over, like we said, right, for i equals one, all the way up to and including i equals four. And then after the for loop is done with all of its iterations, it just prints out a nice formatted string of the grand total. And so what this really does is show us the running sum or the running total over time, really just adding numbers from one through four. So let's give this a go. And here I can see how my total changes over time. So let's kind of trace through it maybe with some annotations. So at the very start, I know that my total is equal to zero. Let's go through these uh, iterations. So on the first iteration of this for loop, I know i is equal to one. And when I evaluate this for loop, I check, is one less than five? That's a true statement, so I can run the code inside for now. So what I do is zero, because my total is currently zero, plus equals one, so I update it. And then I print out my current value for total, which is exactly one, so that gives us our first uh, line of print. Next iteration, I do i plus plus, so now i is equal to two, right? And I check, is two less than five? That statement's true, so I add two into my total. Total right now is one, so I do one plus two is three. And then I print out that total, it gives me three. Next iteration, I add one to my i again. So right now, my i is going to be three. I check, is three less than five? That's true. I add three into my total, so now my total is six. And of course, I print out that six. Last iteration, now my i is going to be four, and I check, is four less than five? That's true. Right, so I'm able to run this code. I add four into my total, so six plus four is 10. Then I print out that total of 10. And technically I would check one more iteration, right? So I was just previously four, I add one to it, and now it's five, but I check, is five strictly less than five? That is false, so I'm finished with this for loop. That means I proceed to any code after the for loop. So I print out my grand total, which is still 10. 
All right, so that was the walkthrough for section zero of this exercise set. So we're able to interpret all of these snippets, I think for now, let's take a break. And in the next one, we're gonna go over how to write and actually solve these functions.